Hello and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Residents of Akwesas, need the Mohawk Territory, straddling Quebec, Ontario and the United States, woke up with one less headache this morning. They now have a dedicated priority lane at the Cornwall border crossing. Some feel it's good news, while others foresee issues. Lindsay Richardson explains. It's the morning of the U.S. election, and Canada's side of the Cornwall border crossing is quiet. As of 7 a.m., Canadian Border Services opened a priority crossing lane for Akwesasne residents in a collaboration with the Mohawk Council. The intent of the domestic lane is to create a smoother, faster border crossing experience by separating the domestic traffic from the international traffic. Cornwall is the only port of entry with both local and international traffic. Akwesasne falls on the borders of Quebec, on Ontario and New York State. Its residents make up 70% of traffic at the Cornwall Crossing, so CBSA is hoping to make things easier. International traffic, including those coming from St. Regis and Sny, will use the main lanes, one through three. The domestic travelers, anyone who has not left Canada, will use lane four, the domestic lane. Likely one else 24. Akwesasne Grand Chief Abraham Benedict says the priority lane is not a new idea. Wait times have long frustrated Akwesasne Rono. Some people say there's more to it. I've had border guards try to try to uh, lecture me on the way the real world works. You know, um, I, I've been searched. I've had my mail gone through in the car. You know, uh, I've been patted down. So. All of that's happened, and you know, everybody's got a story. They're, they're an occupation of our, our land. They have all the guns, so we comply because they have all the guns. Abuse of power, for example, is not a new concern. In 2017, Jody Swamp tried to cross from the Ontario side with $300 worth of firecrackers in his car. He was criminally charged. But in 2019, a judge dropped all charges, saying Swamp was traveling domestically and border guards had no right to search him. A weight was lifted off my shoulders, you know, having them come down on me for no reason. Swamp is leading a class action lawsuit alleging discrimination, detention or search and seizures at this checkpoint. The COVID-19 pandemic slowed the certification process. The lawsuit is still in limbo, but residents remain concerned for their fundamental rights. From a traditional point of view, we've never we've never left our territory. So, we're not leaving Canada or the US. We're we're our own. It doesn't matter if we're small. <laughs> There's a lot of small countries out there. I think we're bigger than some of those small countries. The lane will be open daily for the next six months, at which point the pilot project will be reviewed. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Cornwall, Ontario. It's no surprise in the Yukon that Chinook salmon numbers are down this year. For the last two decades, Chinook stocks have been unpredictable, and First Nations people in the territory have been careful to conserve them. But as Sarah Connors tells us, the answer as to what's causing the, the depletion might lie across the U.S. border. For Carl Sidney, this summer was like the last 20, a summer without Chinook salmon. Zero. Today there is nothing. This fish camp in Teslin was once a place of gathering for him and his extended family. Like most of his people, Sydney grew up eating Chinook salmon, which he says were once bountiful in the Yukon River. There were lots, <laughs> put it like that, you know, like... <clears throat> I guess a good way to put it is we could, we could do our fishery for our family of 50. We could uh, have all our fishery done in a matter of five days. But these days, the camp is mostly abandoned. The Yukon River is dotted with sonar projects designed to count the number of passing salmon. This year, about 50,000 Chinook salmon were expected at a sonar project on the border with Alaska. But in August, only 30,000 Chinook had been counted, making it one of the lowest counts on record. As a result, a salmon advisory board recommended that First Nation people in the Yukon stop fishing Chinook for the rest of the year. That might be a big ask for some, but not in the Yukon. For years, the territory's indigenous population have noticed far less Chinook in the Yukon River, and hardly any First Nations fish Chinook salmon. 
Carl Sidney fears this year's low count is a sign that Chinook might soon be facing extinction. If we continue going down the road we're going right now, it's just a matter of 15 to 20 years that there isn't going to be any more Chinook if we don't start doing something about it. Yukon River Chinook live in the Bering Sea near Alaska, but migrate to the Yukon to spawn. Decades ago, drainage runs numbered about 300,000 fish. Now, it's half that number. First Nations in the territory have been trying for the last two decades to repopulate their stocks. For years, Teslin Clinkett First Nation had to fly in their salmon for ceremonies. Despite their efforts, results have been fleeting. They're doomed from the beginning. Their whole life is just a fight, I guess. No one can say for sure what's happening to these fish. Climate change, extreme weather, and even an influx of harbor seals have all been linked as possible causes. But for many First Nations here in the Yukon, the culprit is in Alaska. Many First Nations people in the Yukon believe that commercial fisheries in Alaska over-harvested Chinook in the 1980s and 90s. Commercial fishing of Chinook is no longer allowed in the Yukon River, though sales of incidental catches are still permitted. This year for Canadians to see that now every fish that they harvest reduces that spawning escapement, that's pretty frustrating for them, I'm sure. Despite failing to meet this year's border objective, area management biologist Holly Carroll says the department has a proven track record of meeting these goals in previous years, even surpassing it from 2014 to 2018. We actually exceeded the border goal by, by almost an average of 20,000 extra fish. A, a lot of people like to say we've just failed to meet the goals every year. That's not the case. We actually found a management strategy where we were able to exceed the escapement goals with Canada. Last year, the department failed to meet the number of fish allowed to escape for spawning by only 500 fish, which she says was unexpected due to relatively high sonar counts in Alaska. In the last two years, the department has noticed huge disparities in the number of fish entering Alaska and those making it to the Yukon. But as to what's causing the disparity remains a mystery. That's the problem with salmon biology is it's so complicated. By the time you think you've got it figured out, it'll double or it'll drop. I think the runs are going to come back in the sizes that are all over the map. And we just keep reacting to that. We keep trying to just you know, do the same thing. For the First Nations people in the Yukon who have gone decades without fishing, the idea that Alaska has mostly been meeting the border objectives is hard to believe. Can't agree with her. Maybe they met them goals a couple times, but this obviously is not enough. Fishing season is ending and the final number of Chinook that made it to the Yukon is currently being counted. But for people like Carl Sidney, fishing Probably season has already ended years, years ago. And we've done without salmon for 20 years, you know, like what's another 20 years going to, if we could rebuild the stock in 20 years, at least we'll have something for the future. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. That's great work there by our Sarah Connors in the Yukon. Hopefully those salmon numbers start to rise soon. We have to take a short break, but stay with us. We go to Quebec when we return. Welcome back. Three years after a 22-year-old's death in police custody, his Inuit family is still angry that no one has been held responsible. They are not without reason. An APTN investigation shows that the way his case was handled raises several red flags. Tom Fenario now with part one of this investigation called Sibowak's death. It doesn't take any prompting to get Louisa Surasila to play a video of her son, Sibowak, dancing. Sivouak won awards for the half-tap dance, half-jig hybrid style that is popular in the Nunavik region. Here he is dancing in his hometown of Pervernatuk. Sivouak also loved hockey, especially Washington Capitals left winger Alexander Ovechkin. On April 28, 2017, at 6.28 a.m., the 24-year-old posted this on Facebook. Good morning. I hope I'll see Ovechkin someday. 
in heaven. About 11 hours after its posting, Sivuak would be found dead in a jail cell in Pravunatok. They found out around 5.30 <laughs> and his body was already cool. This press release by Quebec's Director of Prosecution details the broad strokes of what happened. The Katowic Regional Police Force received a call at 9.20 a.m. from a man requesting help getting drunk people out of his home. Two Katowic police officers arrived at the scene minutes later and took two inebriated men out of the house. Police dropped the first individual at home, during which time Sivuak appears to fall asleep in the car. Police took him to the Pavernatuk police station to sober up. According to the release, officers put Sivuak in a cell and placed him on his stomach. It then jumps ahead to 5.13 p.m. when a civilian guard informs police that Sivuak is not responding to the guard's attempts to wake him. When police arrive, they find that Sivuak hasn't moved since they put him in the cell. Sivuak is pronounced dead at 5.47 p.m. at the Pravernatuk Health Center. The cause of death is later found to be alcohol poisoning. But the pathologist could not exclude Sivuak's body position in the cell as a possible cause of death. Officials conclude that there was no grounds to press charges of criminal negligence against Katowic police. When they arrested him, there was no guard. No one was there. Sivuak's sister Freddie says that investigators told the family that there was no one to replace the overnight guard when Sivuak was brought in. When there is no guard, a police officer is supposed to take over duties. Officials won't say whether anyone was keeping an eye on Sivuak when he was brought in until the evening shift guard discovered his body. April 28, 2017 was the worst day of my life. In this statement her mother wrote and that Freddie translated to English, it's clear that it's something the family would like clarified. They took too long to find out that he was dead. I thought they have cameras. They neglect him. Quebec's Independent Investigation Bureau, known by its French acronym BEI, is responsible for investigating incidents where a person dies or is seriously injured by police in Quebec. They are responsible for investigating Sivouac's death. When the Sirocida family contacted the BEI for their full report, they were referred to the Quebec coroner. This was back in March of 2019. The Quebec coroner's website is in French, and the Sirocilac family speaks in Nuktatut with English as their second language. Nonetheless, in May of 2019, Sivouac's mother Louisa managed to file a request for the autopsy, toxicology, and investigation reports. It took the coroner over a year to deny Louisa's requests. Meanwhile, APTN News made repeated requests for the coroner's report, which, unlike the other reports, is open to the public by law. In June of 2020, 15 months after prosecutors decided not to press charges and more than three years after Sivouac's death, the head coroner admits that Sivouac's case fell between the cracks. Ça a échappé à tout le monde au bureau. Puis la raison pourquoi j'ai essayé de trouver, mais je ne l'ai pas trouvé malheureusement. Vous avez bien porté ça à mon attention, avec raison. Décadé adds that everyone thought the prosecutors had yet to make a decision in Sivouac's case. But EPTN's access to information request for email sent by the coroner office raises questions about this reasoning. Tomorrow in part two of this story, we'll look into how this happened and how several red flags involving Sivouac's death were ignored. Tom Fenario, ABTN National News, Montreal. So, how did it happen? Well, it's time for one more break, but coming up, part two of our look at the death of an Inuk man in police custody. <laughs> Welcome back. Following an, a an APTN News investigation, Quebec's head coroner admits that the file of an Anuk man who died in police custody fell through the cracks. Questions are also being raised about why the coroner did not make any recommendations to prevent further deaths. Tom Fenerio now has part two of his investigation into Sivouac's death. 22-year-old Sivouac Ilyasiuk's 2017 death in a police cell has left a hole in his family. 
They say their grief is compounded by nagging questions concerning his demise. Every day I thought of him, how he died. But they say getting answers to how Sivouac was left alone for eight hours in a jail cell to die of alcohol poisoning has been exasperating. This interview was done in November of 2018. It took a year and a half for APTN News to find out more about Sivouac's case. And while we haven't gotten all the answers that the family is looking for, we have discovered several red flags regarding how Sivouac's case was handled. Sivouac died in the custody of the Katowic Regional Police Force. Because he died in police custody, Quebec's police watchdog, the BEI, was called in to investigate. The BEI then presented its investigation to Quebec prosecutors, who found that Katowic police were not guilty of criminal negligence. Sivouac's mother vehemently disagrees. Eight hours out in there. <laughs> When Quebec prosecutors decided not to press charges against police in Sivouac's death, the family asked to see the investigation report. They are particularly interested in seeing video from the jail cell. They were told to go through the coroner. When APTN reached out to the coroner in March of 2019, we were told that the report should be available in the coming weeks. Follow-up requests received similar responses. So APTN filed an access to information request to get Civil Act's coroner report and for the communications between coroner staff on the dossier. Here's what we found. In March of 2019, days after prosecutors decide not to press charges, a flurry of emails were sent regarding Civil Act's file. An administrator asked the coroner in charge of Civil Act's dossier, a while ago, you asked me to keep your report in the file in case of any twist. Is it still appropriate to keep it in reserve? The coroner's reply, and many other parts of the emails obtained by APTN, are redacted. But in 11 pages of emails, what does become apparent, Civil Act's case fell between the cracks. In May of 2019, Civil Act's file is mistakenly thought to be waiting on the prosecutor's decision. And the mistake is noticed in February 2020, but nothing is done about it until June, when AP10 files its access to information request. Une erreur de communication manifeste là. Pourquoi personne n'a vu ça? C'est malheureux, on ne l'a pas vu. Aujourd'hui, probablement qu'il y a des risques très très minimes qu'une chose comme ça se produise. Pascal Descari is the head coroner of Quebec. She's seen here testifying at the Vienne Commission. She granted us an interview after APTN brought the treatment of Sivouac's dossier to her attention. The carry explained that a technician has recently been assigned to make sure that the communications between coroner staff flow smoother. She also took the time to explain the role of the coroner. On veut protéger la vie de d'autres personnes en essayant de comprendre ce qui s'est passé dans des décès malheureux, euh, possiblement évitables. Aside from determining the circumstances in a violent death, the coroner also has the power to make recommendations in the hopes of preventing similar fatalities. Jimmy Sivouac et Le Cielux coroner report had none. This despite several red flags regarding his case. The Provenaduc jail was the subject of a 2015 Quebec Bar Association report that called the jail conditions third world as well as a 2016 Quebec Ombudsman report into justice in Nunavik. On nous parle de problèmes sérieux du gardiennage. Yeah. The subject also came up 18 months after Sivouac's death, when Katowic police chief Jean-Pierre Larose testified before the Quebec inquiry into the relationship between Indigenous people and public services. Inquiry lawyer Paul Crapeau pressed Larose on the state of the region's jail cells. Je veux dire, on nous a parlé euh, d'eau froide, de mauvais traitements, d'insultes, d'injures, euh, de, de, de ne pas donner des médicaments, de ne pas fournir les besoins essentiels à la vie. La Rose told the commissioner that they don't have enough officers to patrol communities and staff the jails. So they hire civilian guards. 
parce que dans certaines communautés, on n'en a pas beaucoup. APTN News' request to speak to Steve Poisson, the coroner who wrote Civil Wax Coroner's report, was refused. Dick Carey says that she cannot question Poisson's decision to not make recommendations. Je comprends les familles qu'elles qu aimeraient bien qu'il que, qu y ait des recommandations. Je comprends tout à fait ça. Mais ce que je peux vous dire, par contre, c'est qu'il y a peut-être seulement 8 de nos dossiers de coroner qui ont des recommandations. C'est pas tant que ça, hein? One call for action by the Quebec Inquiry asked that liaison officers for public services be chosen by Indigenous authorities to work with the communities they serve. The Office of the Coroner does not have a specific liaison officer. But after their interview with APTN News, the coroner's office announced the creation of a new committee called Mortality in Indigenous and Inuit Communities. They took too long to find out that he was dead. Back in Pravernatuk, Sivouac's family is adamant they want to see the video from the jail cell to know what happened from the time Sivouac entered the jail until his cold body was found nearly eight hours later. The coroner says if they want the video, they'll have to make a legal case to the Minister of Public Security. They neglect him. Meanwhile, 180 kilometers to the south in the community of Inukshuak, the BEI is working on a new case. On August 28th, a 45-year-old man was found dead in a cell in this Katavik police station. From the BEI comes a familiar refrain. The investigation is ongoing. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Montreal. We want to hear what you think about Sivouac's death. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca, leave a comment on aptnnews.ca, or you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. And now there's another way to get your Indigenous news coverage, and that's on TikTok. We've recently joined the popular video sharing platform. Take a look at our latest post. CNN categorized a race of voters as something else during live coverage of the American election results. Indigenous people on either side of the medicine line took the label to mean them. The internet did the rest. But the reaction wasn't all satirical. Many took serious issue with the coverage, pointing out the colonial implications of the something else label, saying it erases and minimizes Indigenous people's impact on the political landscape of the United States. CNN told APTN News that the poor choice of words has since been corrected. Next time, they'll hopefully think of something else to use in their news graphics. Follow us on tiktok.com slash at APTN News for more videos. Well, that's been your look at APTN National News for this Monday. For more Indigenous news, you can visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great night.